Okay. Hi, and welcome to this second lecture of the little mini course called Dualities in Space Time in String Theory. And in this lecture, I will be a little bit more technical in some, some respects. Uh, I will address the question how I think the dualities should be interpreted. And I will also discuss how we should think about space time in the context of string theory. There are two possible responses. One can kind of think of this as a case of underdetermination, where we actually think that even though these theories are empirically equivalent, they actually describe two different alternatives. And then, of course, there are, could be problems. I mean, the general, I mean, how can we choose between them? We, we're kind of uh, getting um, kind of an epistemic problem. That is, I expect you to be uh, familiar with. Another way is to think that there is some kind of invariant structure that is shared between the two theories, and these things represent the real physics. The other features might be some kind of mathematical extra uh, things that shouldn't be given a physical interpretation, and we can see them as kind of pragmatic or conventional or something like that. They don't represent anything kind of any real features of, of reality. And there have been some earlier work on dualities, and there is still a lot of things written on, uh, on dualities, uh, different accounts. And uh, for philosophy, it might be natural to think of this as, as a case of underdetermination, but this is how we're not the way physicists typically understand these dualities. And uh, earlier ph ph philosophical work have already pointed out that if we understand the dualities in the way that the physicists do as describing the same physical situation, then that rules out a realistic interpretations of the part that differ between the dualities. And I suggest you look at some earlier articles by Richard David and uh, Dean Rickles. And you can, uh, I can also mention my, uh, uh, an old article myself from 2013 that you might find useful. A recent article by James Reed is pretty good also uh, by giving different options or interpretative options that one might take to think about dualities. So there you might see alternatives in some of these papers to the way I present it. And uh, so uh, if you want, you can look at that and, and think more about that. And some of these articles that I mentioned uh, discuss possible connections with uh, the with structural realism and the debate about scientific realism. And I will not really focus that much on that in this talk, even though to some extent, for people who are kind of aware of that debate, you might see that indirectly, I will kind of bring some of that out. So why do I think one should not think of these dualities as cases of underdetermination? It might be tempting to think of it like that because it's kind of a simple and straightforward way. But I think one need to look more carefully at how the theories are formulated and figure out what should be interpreted in physical terms. Another aspect that I find extremely important is to think of the relationship between the classical and the quantum formulations. And I think the reason why people think of these as possible underdeterminations is that they look too much at the classical description, which is something I don't think is as important as the quantum formulation, which is uh, the one that is the same between these two descriptions. In general, when we just have a mathematical formalism, that by itself is not physics. Uh, to make it physical, we need some kind of physical interpretation and suggest like what in this formalism should we interpret physical and what kind of physical interpretation should it have. Ideally, it should be connected to some kind of observable phenomena, at least indirectly. And string theory is a quantum theory. I mean, we can define classical string theory as well, but that is not really what we're interested 
And I think this quantum theory must be the starting point of the physical interpretation. With this, I don't really mean that I want to address the kind of the general problem of interpretation quantum, interpreting quantum physics or the measurement problem or anything like that. I'm just saying that the quantum theory is kind of the starting point kind of the, the of interpretation. And this means basically that the original classical formula, formulations used to arrive at the quantum theory should not be taken as physically interpreted, at least not initially. I'll come back to how they might be relevant in certain limits again later. Uh, the classical formulations can be metaphorically thought of some kind of scaffolding that you set up just in order to build or, or construct the quantum theory. And that is the kind of relevant endpoint. But when interpreting, interpreting theories, we need to understand how, how the older theories that we're more familiar were, with arise in certain limits. And I suggest uh, the following principle, that even though the new theory, the more fundamental one, has some kind of ontological priority, this is what really builds up the world somehow. Uh, the, the old theory have a semantic priority in the sense we need to understand what the new theory says. We need to understand how it connects to the older familiar theory and their concepts to really make sense of it. If we just have some kind of uninterpreted uh, formalism and we don't understand how it connects to what we understand from the older theories, we don't really understand what the new theory tells us. So where does the interpretation start? We should not take for granted or think that the initial description always gives uh, a, a good fiscal interpretation. In general, we should just be very wary of making this, uh, this commitment. Uh, in the case of string theory, the quantum theory must be the starting point for this fiscal uh, interpretation. And as I said, I've used uh, a metaphor of thinking of the classical description of scaffolding or a stepping stone or something that we just use as a as a way of getting at the quantum theory. However, as I, I will repeat this a little bit because I don't want this point to be missed, the classical pictures might still be useful and give us clues about interpretation, but one must be very careful here. I'll come back to that. So clarifications. It's easy to misunderstand what I'm saying with this classic metaphor. metaphor. Uh, because saying that the starting points are scaffolding does not rule out these pictures as not valuable at all. Of course, they might be valuable for calculational purposes. Uh, some of the one picture or the other might be easier to, to calculate with, so that gives a pra pragmatic advantage. And furthermore, they might, in a sense, be correct in certain limits of the theory. Uh, one or the other, not both at the same time, though. Uh, but the duality undermines a straightforward understanding of the pictures in general. And if there are parameters that can be adjusted, then different adjustments can lead to different uh, uh, pictures. We have different ways we can reach classical limits. And different scaffoldings can because the scaffoldings are classical descriptions in a sense and they might reappear in certain classical limits but then it's just either one or the other not both at the same time uh, but for a large part of the parameters space or the options of duality it might be that we should not trust any of the pictures given to give a even an effective description of physical reality. Exactly how to this, how to cash this out, might be different from one duality to another. So now I present a little bit more of formalism, um, like uh, like this. Uh, so it's a physical system can be determined by specific specifying a number of parameters called lambda i. And these parameters identify points uh, in a moduli space, in a physicist's slightly more general or sloppy sense compared to uh, mathematicians. Uh, but 
to give some kind of hint of what those parameters would be, would be specifying the parameters would correspond to a specific compactification uh, in string theory uh, and a specific geometry of the target space. And if you change uh, the parameters, you change that geometry and and um, shape of, of uh, the target space. Uh, so uh, there are also observables, and here I mean observables in uh, the quantum uh, physics sense. And if we have a duality, all correlation functions uh, are preserved under the duality mapping. But the correlation functions of the observable might also be functions of the lambdas. So if you change uh, uh, the lambda parameters on one side, that also corresponds to changing the lambda parameters on the other side. Let's call them the lambda tilde parameters in the dual pictures. We have the, 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 the two systems, Q, with a moduli space and a set of observables, and Q tilde, M tilde, O tilde, alpha, etc. With uh, and if there is an isomorphism about uh, preserving all these correlation functions, we have a duality. And the important thing to note here is that the data that is preserved or is isomorphic in this duality is the quantum data, the, the quantum description of this even though the lambdas might describe some kind of classical geometry or, or, or whatever, what's preserved is the, the, something that is encoded only on, on, the, on the quantum level. So I will make one little distinction that is not always made. This is type of duality versus a specific instance. So a type of duality is when you have this kind of moduli space and you can tweak it around on one side corresponds to changing the parameters on the other side. Uh, so that is a kind of duality. And for specific values, so you fix the lambdas, then you also fix the lambda tildes, then we have a specific instance of what I would call dual models. And I could call them dual theories. Be wary, I'm using model in a slightly non-standard sense here. They could be seen as theories in themselves as well. Uh, but the model here uh, is basically uh, what we would think of as one certain background compactification. You can also have things like background fields or something, or other things like D brains that I haven't really talked about. But that kind of describes the kind of prima facie classical picture and that's specified by the lambdas. And then on the other side, you have uh, uh, the lambda tildes that corresponds to that. So sometimes we can glide be between having a type of duality or a specific case when we have fixed the lambdas on both sides. So uh, the question then about effective ontology. We know that basically we, we at the classical level, if you look, look at the full classical information given by the lambdas, we don't have isomorphic structures. I mean, there are plenty of things that are different in the classical models. So they're not equivalent. What's equivalent are the quantum models, that I would say. And I use here a notation where uh, I have one um, model with a superscript C for classical and Q for quantum, and that while the classical models are not isomorphic, the qu resulting quantum models are. So in that sense, the duality of the, of the kind, the, at least the kind of dualities I'm talking about here, rise only at the quantum level. The classical pictures are very different, but the quantum, uh, the resulting quantum structure is the same. That's kind of the basis for talking about dualities. And I introduce a slightly weird description, or not description, but notation for a model where I uh, have uh, I, I write basically a model, a quantum model, but I, I write both the lambda and the lambda tilde parameters within there, but with a little double arrow between them. And this is basically to indicate that we're not really committed to any 
of the original classical picture, only this kind of shared quantum structure. And that should be the starting point for, for the information, for, for, the, for the interpretation. And the question then is, is there an effective ontology given a specific situation or model MQ lambda i double R O lambda tilde? And with that, that in mind, I, I phrase it so, in a sense, it's almost like you keep both pictures in mind, but trust none of them and only think of the, of the quantum picture. What is it here? And note also that it can change as you change the lambda parameters. But the lambda and the lambda tilde parameters cannot be changed independently of each other. They are, if you fix the lambdas, you fix the lambda tildes. And a change in lambda corresponds to a change in lambda tilde. I have not taken into account the possibility that some of the, there might be some gauge redundancies on one side or the other uh, of the, of the uh, theories. It's only... Uh, uh, so I, I, to simplify the presentation, I've assumed that this kind of a, a lambda fixes a unique lambda tilde. But if there are or gauges, there are some other sub subtleties there that might be uh, have to be addressed. So with this kind of idea of the classical picture and the scaffolding metaphors, this kind of de-emphasizes the classical picture. But note that another way of thinking about geologies or how they, they are sometimes explained is by saying that you have one quantum theory with different classical limits. And how does this fit together? And the point is basically that for certain choices of the lambda and lambda tilde parameters, there might be an effective picture which turn out to be very much like one or the other of the dual picture. But once again, in the general case, it be, might be that none of the classical pictures applies even as an effective picture. So it's almost like you have one regime of parameter space where one picture applies, another one when uh, the other picture applies, there might be some other useful pictures in between. And then there, but exactly what those other picture would be is very difficult in general to figure out. That's kind of a challenge to do that. And it might be that there is no kind of useful classical picture for large parts of what we otherwise would think of as space time. That's kind of basically the idea. And how do we recover space time then? I mean, in principle, this is a little bit kind of uh, tricky. It's tricky to do this in general, but basically the idea here is that if we think of space time as something physical, it actually must be a shared consequence of the both of the two formulations. So it has to be the same in both. And it has to be derived basically only from the pure quantum data. And of course, that's very difficult in practice. So often there is some kind of semi-classical reasoning or something like that. And I also suggest that the space that must be sufficiently uniquely specified by super Riemannian math, or rather the way we describe space-time in general relativity should be kind of recoverable as a useful approximations in certain limits. It doesn't mean that space-time is ultimately or fundamentally like the way it is in general relativity. But if we cannot even approximate it with that, I'm not sure how we should think of this as being a spatiotemporal description. And the description in terms of this manifold should also be derived only on the shared content uh, that is derivable from both pictures. And of course, when I say Riemannian manifold, I mean defined up to diffeomorphisms, and perhaps we can also allow for little further minor variations away from that. Like we can have slightly different manifolds that could be uh, counted as effectively working equally well. But the number of dimensions, I, I suggest, uh, will be defined by the best uh, identification or something of a super Riemannian manifold that is the same, which is, is fixed, and it doesn't have to agree with any of the ones suggested by the original pictures, though. So this is very important. So roughly, given a specific solution, how can a unique effective space-time be determined? And when I say specific solution, I mean that uh, a specific lambda-lambda-tilde, so both are fixed, uh, is basically having both models 
uh, in mind, but, but figure out what is their shared effective picture based, like what is their kind of effective or phenomenal or in principle empirical space time that we can drive the same for both uh, uh, dual models. And now when we change the duality, change the parameters, the effective picture can, can change. So uh, I have a conjecture that I think need a little bit more um, underpinning or should be argued for a little bit better. But in general, when we have small quantum corrections to classical picture, we kind of can say that the classical picture give a rather good description. And often it is the case that in a duality, one of the pictures is basically a classical picture with small quantum corrections, and on the other side, it's the other way around. You have uh, large quantum fluctuations, and you don't have any kind of, uh, you can, you don't have any neat classical background uh, around which you can make good perturbative calculations or, or things like that. So in this sense, it's almost like, the, if, even though in principle, if we could do the calculations, on the, the other side, we know if the duality is exact that we have to arrive at exactly the same amplitudes and everything has to be the same. But when we ask the question about what the effective picture would be, then it would be closer for each pair of models to the one where we have only small corner corrections. I think that is in general uh, a reasonable idea. It might be tricky there, but in general, when, when, when you don't clearly have a, a strong a preference for one over the other, it will be kind of fussy. And there, there is kind of situation where we cannot really trust any of the pictures. Like none of them are kind of perturbatively tractable in this sense. And I know this is kind of pretty vague and it needs to be kind of perhaps um, argued for a little bit more in detail. And I should also try to figure out what the effective picture would be in intermediate states if there are kind of good effective pictures then at all. So then let's look at T-duality. So what then is the real radius in the case of T-duality? So as I said, we have to identify space-time by something that is the same in both pictures. Here, there, we can actually do a little bit of, there is arguments, previous arguments for prioritizing the larger radius as being the radius for effective uh, space-time. And this is basically done by identifying the state representing the photon and figure out what would that, uh, how long it would take for this to return in the relevant kind of uh, compact dimension in some sense. And it turns out that both pictures actually give rise to the same effective radius. So in this sense, in terms of potential measurements, even if we start with the small radius or the bigger radius, it turns out that in terms of effective or uh, phenomenal or potentially empirical space-time, it turns out to be that the larger radius is prioritized. So even though for mathematical purposes you can just as fine use uh, the small radius as the big radius, when you change them, it's always the bigger radius that is uh, suitable to represent space-time. Um, and there is, Nick, Nick Hyatt has a forthcoming paper on this, philosophical paper, and there is also an old paper by, by Brandenberger and Waffa when they discuss this issue. So uh, what are the parameters in, 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 in T-geology? Here it's pretty simple. The parameters is basically the, the radius R, and the dual radius, R tilde, they are our lambda parameters here. So we can basically change them. So if if this this my my this hand is one of the radia, radia, then the other one is. So this is R and this is R tilde, and if you push that down, it pushes the other one up. And for each of these kind of selections of radius, we can ask. What's the effective picture for this choice of radii? It turns out to be 
effectively like this one because that's a big radius and here it's the other way around and note though in in super string theory you also switch 2a to 2b so even though the larger radius is always the one that's kind of prioritized as, uh, prioritized as potentially spatial temporal whether we get a, a 2a or, or 2b there that's kind of depends on which one corresponds to the larger radius, right? So in that sense, we also have, this also kind of illustrates the idea of having different, different um, limits uh, where, but, but in general, it's, it, it's the, the larger of the two dual radii that is kind of a contender. However, though, especially if we think of the string length as very close to the Planck length, length. When we get to the self-dual radius, when the radii are the same, we're very close to the Planck length. So then I think it's probably better to not even think of that as spatial temporal. We shouldn't even trust the picture at all. Uh, and we should then just effectively say we have one fewer dimension. And that's basically what you do when we have these compactification and they are kind of a, at the Planck scale. Effectively, we have fewer dimensions. And in that sense, even though there is kind of a possibility of thinking of this as a very small spatial temporal dimension, I don't think that kind of makes that much sense. Anyway, what's important is kind of the pictures, how that appears in the effective four the effective fewer dimensional picture that we, we have left. And then what should we think of in the case of mirror symmetry? Then we cannot kind of, here we have, four large di dimensions that are the same in both pictures. So fine, we can think of them as spatial temporal. Uh, but the compact six dimensions, they don't give a, a, a unique picture of, of, of space time. So we cannot really trust them. And the quantum data don't really distinguish between them. And especially, uh, so in general, I think we shouldn't trust any of these or think of them as spatial temporal. We, we effectively only have four, four, four dimensions that are the ones we, we're kind of more used to, and some kind of quantum fluff, loose term, uh, that kind of indicates the kind of compactification. But there is no kind of fact of the matter what, what that, uh, that there is a space tiny thing there. So. I think one should refrain from giving that a spatial temporal interpretation. And I think this is specifically in the case when both the dual manifolds are microscopic and close to the Planck length. I mean, we don't, we cannot really um, discern anything there. But note that in analogy with T duality, we can have some limits where more dimensions pop up or even. It could even be the case that one of these six-dimensional manifolds actually appear in, in some parts of, of the parameter space. And it's difficult to fig figure out exactly when this happens, but it's interesting though that Waffa has also say, said, and I, I don't claim to understand this in, 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 in detail, but duality is suppressed for bigger volumes. So I think this is kind of analog analogous to the case where you have um, uh, in T-Jod, we have that one very small radius and one very big one. It's always kind of a fact of the matter which one is the big one. And I think it is the case that the, the bigger uh, volume, if you kind of read them naively as kind of take the classical picture as naively correct, then the big one would correspond better to the effective picture. Of course, this is pretty hand wavy, and there might also be other limits where none of the pictures appear, but maybe we get one extra dimension or two extra dimensions or, or something like that, but the other one remains kind of in this kind of vague, more quantum fluffy thing. But it's basically the idea is that in, we, we ask the question for each specific choice of lambda parameters, and then we ask the question, what is the best kind of effective spatial temporal description here. And in general, it doesn't have to agree, agree with any of the classical uh, uh, descriptions described by the lambdas and the lambda tildes. But for some certain choices, the effective picture might actually agree, agree with one 
or the other, but in general, none of the pictures apply. So there is a lot of things which is kind of hinted at and just suggested and conjectured here. But I think this, uh, this is, uh, in general, I think, the correct way of understanding what's, what's really going on. So it's more of a dynamical situation. It's not so much that it's, it's either this picture or that picture all along. It's all that, in general, trust none of the pictures, but in some choices of parameters, one of the pictures or the other might actually be give a good description. So, uh, what has been said so far fits pretty well with the following quote, quotation from uh, Ed Witten, who's the leading string theorist. Uh, string theorists have been that for, for a long time. And talking about mirror symmetry and saying that which is a relationship between two space-times that would be quite distinct in ordinary physics, but turn out to be equivalent in string theory. The equivalence is possible because in string theory, one does not really have classical space-time, but only the corresponding two-dimensional field theory. Two apparently different space-times, X and Y, can co correspond to equivalent two-dimensional field theories. And what's basically said here is that the two-dimensional field theories, which is, are defined on, on the world sheets, this is what it kind of encodes the, the, the physical content. Still, he uses the term space-time here, so I think that might be, be, be slightly misleading in, in some sense, because, but since he say one does not really have a classical space-time, I think what he's saying here is, is in agreement with the picture I'm presenting here that that what's what's really what really matters are these kind of what can be encoded in the shared quantum content uh, that is derived and the same regardless of these target space uh, regardless of these target space on the other hand he doesn't really address this question whether we get kind of effective extra dimensions in certain limits and all that but I think that is is so I'm not Kind of saying that he's claiming that in in this quotation, but I, I think this kind of is another thing that I, I still think is is the correct way of understanding this, and it might be that I've misunderstood something, but I don't think so. Uh, so I also uh, now would like to say say a few words on background in independence. Uh, a standard complaint uh, uh, that opponents of string theory say is that string theory lack explicit background independence. On the other hand, string theory say, well, it's kind of background independence because we can derive Einstein's field equations and so on. I think this is this is kind of a slightly tricky issue because what exactly do we mean by background independence and how should we explicate this this concept? This is still debated in, in philosophy of physics. And uh, so I don't want to say too much about that. On the other hand, I think that one should at least ask this question in terms of the right entities. And I think that should be the kind of effective phenomenal or uh, empirical sp space time that I've talked about here, not the target spaces. Basically, it's something that is a shared description of dual, of different dual descriptions, not necessarily the target spaces. I mean, if you don't have dual descriptions, it might be that the target space is a good description of this effective uh, effective uh, space-time, I mean, for, for certain specific backgrounds. But in the presence of dualities, one has to be more wary about that. So I'm just, I'm not trying to answer the question about background independence. I'm just saying that maybe it makes more sense to try to frame this question in terms of this, uh, the right kind of space-time, rather the kind of the space-time that is the shared physical content, the kind of base based on 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 the on the quantum picture, something that arises out of that, and not naively the just the target spaces. And this is because of the, these kind of worries about dualities. And there is also some speculations about M theory, uh, and it's often and uh, were said that M theory is eleven-dimensional. That was kind of the early understanding at least. Uh, this was kind of our first contact with M theory as finding this as some kind of 
11 dimensional theory connected by dualities to, to, to string theories. But we don't, as I mentioned, we don't really know what M theory is, is fully. And some have speculated that the traditional spatial temporal com concepts might not be used to formulate M theory. I'm not trying to answer that question, that's very much an open question, how exactly that will be. But if that turns out to be the case, it still works with the picture I'm presenting here. Because it might be that the because the account I'm I'm giving is basically that the the number of dimension is something that is dependent on the specific solutions and can change and doesn't have like one fixed value all around. So it might be possible to have this kind of underlying M theory that isn't really uh, spatial temporal, and then different number of space effective phenomenal potentially empiric space times appear in different solutions, different limits of this kind of theory. But this is kind of very speculative, and I'm not. I'm just hinting at that as like an interesting possibility. So to summarize, uh, target spaces are used to formulate the uh, target spaces used to formulate formulate string theory. They cannot straightforwardly or uncritically, in general, be thought to describe or represent space time in a good way. The resulting quantum theory should be the starting point for the physical interpretation, and here basically two dimensional quantum conformal field theories used to de describe the strings that will play an important part in the story, and. Uh, also, when we try to figure out the number of dimensions of space-time, we kind of uh, uh, think of what is the best pseudo Riemannian manifold that we can describe that only describe shared joint content of the uh, of the dual descriptions. Uh, what dimensionality does that have? And we want this to be sufficiently un unambiguous. Of course, we can. We can have uh, diffeomorphisms because that still describes the same uh, space time. Uh, but things that aren't captured in, in uh, a sufficiently unique way, we shouldn't think of that as really space time. There is something physical there, some kind of quantum fluff or quantum disturbances around that kind of classical picture. And once again, I'm not saying that the pseudo-Riemannian manifold is kind of the fundamental description of space-time. It's just that the best kind of approximation and the dimensionality of the best approximation, uh, the best pseudo, the dimensionality of the pseudo-Riemannian manifold that best uh, describes the kind of shared content is the dimensionality of that specific solution, which might have dual description, but this result should not depend on which picture you choose. And in T-duality, the larger of the two radii is always the one that has possible significance as representing the radius. On the other hand, as I mentioned, when both radii are very small and getting close to the Planck length, I think maybe we should not really think of them as fully spatial temporal. And in the case of mirror symmetry, um, the six compact dimensions should in general not be given a spatial temporal interpretation but once again in certain limits they might still appear and uh, what i think is the case but i don't understand all the details uh, uh, fully to kind of completely articulate this or, or defend the point i think that uh, sometimes these uh, the the classical pictures actually do appear in certain limits and that is in, in cases where one of uh, the club you have, if read, uh, one of the classical pictures, if read naively, is big and the other is very small. And but exactly how this kind of plays out in all details in all, and for all intermediate cases, I don't know. And there could be intermediate cases where you maybe get one or two extra dimensions, but not the full six dimensions. Um, and that's something I hope to understand better in the future. And uh, this ends this second lecture, and I hope this has been somewhat helpful uh, for, for you to understand uh, a little bit about geologists and how to think of them. And once again, uh, much of this is slightly tentative, and uh, there is still uh, much debate on this.
I mentioned some references in this talk and in the previous talk. And at the end, uh, you can see, see a list of these references to different articles and books. And I advise you to look at these uh, more, to learn more, and perhaps to come to slightly different conclusions than the one I presented here. And I hope you've enjoyed this presentation and thank you very much for listening.